So thank you everyone for coming to our first virtual training of the season. This is uh, Floodplain Basics. It, I made a few updates from the past version we've been doing the last couple years, but most of it is the same. But I did see that quite a few of you have not been to this training before, so I don't think there'll be too much repetition for folks. Um, I'm Seal Strauss, I'm the State Floodplain Coordinator, and I'll be doing most of the presenting. Uh, Matt Bauman is um, working with both our floodplain program and our shoreland program, and he's helping out, and he's gonna be helping monitor that chat area. And uh, Gary Bennett, who is new in the floodplain program assisting us, uh, he has been an area hydro for many years, and he is now um, in the floodplain program. So we'll be the ones uh, presenting here today. And uh, you all have access to, to, to put comments in the chat. At the end, if we have time, um, we'll let you take your mics off um, or unmute your mics and ask questions. But I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the training or right into the presentation because we have a, a lot to cover today. So I will be talking about the National Flood Insurance Program at the federal level, what that involves, what the community roles are, uh, some key definitions, where do the floodplain regulations apply, some basics of the, the permitting and um, regulations, a little bit about shoreland versus floodplain, and a little bit about flood insurance. Many of these topics, we do have separate uh, specific trainings. So I'll be covering things at a fairly high level and covering a lot of material today. So the National Flood Insurance Program is a national program. It was adopted in 1968. The original goal was to get away from trying to build our way out of flood risk. And there had been much more of a focus on building community levees and flood walls and projects in general. And in 1968 is when Congress and the nation said, let's start looking at things a little differently. We're going to try and prevent these problems and do a better job of building smarter in the first place. So the program involves the identification of the high risk, which is the mapping portion. And we'll talk a lot more about the mapping um, at the, the training we're giving next week at the same time. The development standards, so having some guidelines on where you should build and how high you should build and those kinds of things. And then flood insurance became available nationally. Before that, it was hard for private companies to stay in business because they couldn't spread their risk and they'd get a big widespread flood and just couldn't couldn't stay in business because all of their, their uh, policies were in one area and got impacted at once. And then about 20 plus years ago, FEMA added mitigation as a big part of what they're doing. So that's the, the state and local hazard mitigation plans and a lot of grants to try and do projects to reduce risk. So where do we fit in though? So it, and this is a cartoon from my local news, weekly newspaper, but I think it really shows what a lot of people tend to think is that everybody's pointing the finger. It's not clear who to talk to. And that's a big part of what we're talking about today is what are our different roles and knowing who to talk to for help in whatever your role is. So the state did adopt enabling legislation the year after FEMA um, enacted the National Flood Insurance Program. The state act was adopted there in 69. We, I've got the logo there from us celebrating the 50 year anniversary a few years ago. But it, the state was named as the coordinating agency. We had to do that by law to meet the, the federal requirements. And the state's main role is helping communities to do their, their their job in administering the regulations, adopting ordinances, understanding the maps, helping you to be able to do a good job. And we do have, um, there is a requirement that we approve 
local ordinances before they are considered valid. We did add our flood damage reduction, or we call it the hazard mitigation program, grant program in 87. I won't say much about that today, but that's a program that is administered by Pat Lynch. And if you've got questions about what state grants um, assistance there is on our website, we do have a lot of good, useful information about our flood damage reduction program. So roles and responsibilities. As I've already hinted, the uh, locals and your local ordinances, you guys are the most important at the local level. The state has overarching authority for helping you and, and for approving those ordinances. We've got state laws, we've got federal laws, but it's actually administered at the local level. Whoever has that zoning authority, whoever's got that police authority for land use at the local level. So um, FEMA does oversee and is involved in enrolling communities in the first place. And if something happens and they're not doing their job, um, getting them suspended. But for the most part, it's the DNR working with local communities. And then watersheds in many parts of the state are really important partners. They're not the local zoning authority for the floodplain regulations that FEMA has and the state has, but the watershed districts often have their own regulations and they're definitely a great resource in many of those watersheds and have better data. So the zoning authority in Minnesota is going to be the city within the city limits and normally outside the city limits, it's going to be the county regulating that unincorporated part of the, the county. But our state law does allow for townships to choose to uh, take on zoning authority. So a township that has a DNR approved ordinance, floodplain ordinance, can be the, the floodplain zoning authority and can be enrolled and then would be enrolled in the, in the National Flood Insurance Program for the people in your township to be able to take advantage of the benefits of the National Flood Insurance Program. The, the tribes are also very often um, involved and can enroll in the program. They'll work directly with FEMA as sovereign nations, but we're happy to, to assist any of the, the tribal members or uh, staff. Uh, they're welcome to come to our trainings and we'd be happy to help them folks, those folks out any way we can. But for anything official, you'll, the tribes would work directly with FEMA. So it is a partnership that when communities get enrolled in the National Flood Insurance Program, they're adopting that ordinance. They're going to regulate, they're, they're agreeing to regulate those areas that are shown as the higher risk areas. Uh, they are keeping records, they're enforcing those regulations, and mainly they're making sure that they, they actually are actively looking at keeping that those um, any new development to be safer as uh, things get built. The benefits to the community are that anyone in your community can get flood insurance if they choose. Sometimes they'll be told by their lenders they have to get flood insurance and then they'd be able to. There's also many grants and some of the post-disaster assistance that's only available to participating communities. And then there's the overall benefit of showing that your community is really doing the best you can to, to reduce risk and looking after that, the, the health and safety of your citizens and your businesses and keeping things uh, safer and business able to continue and people not being disrupted by flooding. In Minnesota, all of the counties that do zoning are in the program. Most of our cities are in the program. Uh, we do have a, a couple hundred that are not. Usually they're smaller communities or don't have a lot of um, mapped risk areas. We do have a couple of the tribes and we have several of the townships that are have adopted ordinances and are doing the floodplain zoning in, in that township. Uh, over 96% of the state's population does live in a community 
that is in the National Flood Insurance Program. The, if you want to know if a particular community is in the program, if they're enrolled, there's the FEMA Community Status Book. This is what it looks like. Uh, if you zoom in, you can see all of the communities are listed alphabetically. The other information on this is it shows the current effective map date for that community and when they got into either the regular program or the emergency program. The E here stands for emergency program, and I'm not going to get into details about that. If you see a E by your community and want to know more about what that means, it basically means there's less, you have um, maps that are either non-existent or the very first emergency type of maps, and it means there's less uh, flood insurance available that you can get. Uh, the other thing you'll see here sometimes is NSFHA, and that stands for No Special Flood Hazard Area. So that's communities, and in, in our state, we've got eight counties that have the NSFHA, where FEMA has said there's not enough risk to map the risk in this, this county or this, um, this community, and we're calling it all the low risk area. And for the counties that were called no special flood hazard area, basically FEMA recognized and the state recognized that we've got shoreland regulations. Our shoreland regulations require minimum elevations. So we're really taking care of the biggest part of the floodplain concerns with our shoreland regulations in those counties that have mainly lake development. The other thing that's on here is we do have nine communities that are in the community rating system. And those communities, they, they document that they're having higher standards, they're doing a better job of communicating in their communities. They're, um, they're having a lot of the area, typically a good percentage of the area that is in open space, so not at risk uh, from flooding for the most part. And it does show that they get discounts on their flood insurance if the community is in that community rating system. This FEMA document is not completely up to date because now there's the same discount in the whole community, not just in the mapped areas. So it should be showing the 20% discount for anybody in those communities that wants to get flood insurance. Uh, at the end of that community status book, it does list the communities that FEMA has mapped risk but where the community has not gotten enrolled. And sometimes I call that my naughty list. There's a few bigger communities that I'd like to see in particular getting enrolled, but for the most part, the communities are small or the floodplains on the very edge of the community, probably where there's not much development pressure. So the FEMA maps, this is a, an example of the older paper FEMA maps and FEMA maps the high flood risk area. They're basically mapping that 100-year flood elevation, or we try to call it the 1% annual chance flood elevation because we don't pe want people getting it in their mind that, oh, I had a flood, big flood last year, so I'm good for another 99 years. That's not the way it works. But uh, the 1% the is a more accurate way to look at that level of risk is every year we've got a chance of 1% chance of getting to this flood level or higher. Um, on average, it might be once every 100 years, but that's, as we know, the, the floods don't just come every 100 years. Uh, the, so it's that darker shaded area. The medium risk area is on the old maps is light gray. Usually it's going to be your 500 year or your 0.2% annual chance flood. It also can be the 100 year when it's less than a foot deep or the 100 year where it's draining less than one square mile or an area that is protected by some kind of a community wide levy or project of some kind where it's accredited. It meets all the, the legal federal standards to be shown as an official flood control project. And then the low risk areas, they're not shaded. We say low risk, not no risk, partly because um, you can have floods that are bigger than these events, 
and we've seen those in Minnesota. We've seen 14-inch rains, 12-inch rains in big areas of the state. And also, FEMA doesn't map all of the flood risk. They tend to focus on the bigger rivers and the bigger lakes. So there are definitely localized areas that are at risk that FEMA is not showing on their maps. On the newer maps, they're usually going to be digital maps available digitally, so you can lay them on your other layers. And they have that that aerial photo background on the version that FEMA has on their site. The higher risk areas are going to be these light blue and these um, blue and red crosshatch area. So that's that that um, 100 year or the 1% annual chance flood area. The medium risk area, again, the 0.2% or 500 year and some of those other types of risks, they're going to be this kind of uh, brownish color on these maps. And uh, also on the digital maps, the lower risk areas don't have any shading. I mentioned that they're mapping that 1%. When there are more detailed studies being done for these FEMA maps, the other map, uh, they do map other frequencies. Uh, they do show that 500 year, but when they're doing the modeling, they also calculate what that 10 year or the 10% annual chance and the 50 year or the 2% annual chance floods. So in areas where you do have the more detailed information, there is additional data. We're not gonna get into how you find that in today's session, but we do talk about that in our map basics and some of our other uh, sessions where we get into more details. For counties where we've gotten more recent updated data, FEMA started adding a couple more frequencies, that 25-year flood or the 4% annual chance, and something they call the 1% plus because when they're figuring out that 100 year, that 1% plus, there, there's a range of potential elevations that you could be in there or, or amounts of flooding that you could see the, the discharge, the amount of water going through that system for that, that frequency. And for the regulatory purposes, they take the mi middle of that range. But in some places, that range can be pretty wide and having that the, the 95 percentile um, upper bound there can be helpful information when you're looking at things that you're more consider, concerned about the risk, some of the your critical infrastructure that you, you'd like to look at that 500 year and that 1% plus and get a better idea of your risk because you, those are things that you really want to make sure stay safer. Um, I've already mentioned some of these terms, but these are all basically synonymous for our purposes today mentioned the 1% annual chance flood, the 100 year. In FEMA maps and information, they typically call it the base flood elevation or the BFE. And in Minnesota regulations, if you go looking at our statute and rules, you won't see the 1% annual chance mentioned, but you will see a regional flood mentioned, and that's basically the same. And then when FEMA's talking about our lenders or insurance agents are talking about those areas. They talk about the special flood hazard area. So again, that's that 100 year that is in the high risk areas, the, the light blue on the newer maps there. And in general, I'll tend to call it just the high flood risk area. So a few definitions. Back when the program started, right from the beginning, people said, well, gee, you can't treat all of the floodplain the same. You know, the people who are right next to that river that have the deeper levels, they have higher velocities. Yeah, they've got a greater risk than someone who's maybe on a backwater area or on the very edge of the floodplain. So right from the beginning, FEMA has considered the different kinds of impacts that you see in the floodplain. And they started with, when they're doing detailed studies, they divide it into the flood way which is the stream itself and a good portion of that overbank area where you expect more of a risk during floods, and then the flood fringe. And you would certainly include the stream and any of the areas that you expect higher velocities. Where the lines are drawn 
typically is going to be more interactive between the community and the state and FEMA looking at what makes sense. And if there's physical barriers, like in this picture, we have a road and yeah, there are probably some culverts through here, so it's wet, but you don't expect much velocity, more of a backwater kind of situation on that other side of that road. And on the other side, the community be looking at, well, where do we expect development? Can we allow development in this area and still keep the area we need for our floodway? So they, they have the engineers first go and model the, uh, what the floodplain would be with leaving that whole area open. And then they look at these kind of factors and they, in the model, they simulate that all of that flood fringe area is filled in, that that area is not available for the floodwaters to go into during a flood. And as you squeeze in that floodplain, it does mean that the floodwaters will increase in that floodway. The federal maximum, they can squeeze that in and cause an increase as a foot. In Minnesota, right from the beginning, our law has said it's a maximum of a half a foot that will allow, mainly in rural areas where there's not already buildings, but th that if there are existing buildings, we can't cause any increase. So the amount you can cause an increase is definitely limited compared to what's allowed nationally. And the other thing that we look at that's a national requirement is that the lowest floor of any new buildings or any substantially improved or damaged buildings has to be at least at the flood elevation or higher. And in Minnesota, right from the beginning, we said, well, gee, we just said it's legal to fill in all these areas and cause up to half of a foot of increase we will take that into consideration as that flood elevation is going to be with any increase we've said is legal to do. And we're going to have a foot of freeboard, a safety factor there. And we call that our regulatory flood protection elevation. So that is the Minnesota minimum elevation for the lowest floors. And for a little while, that foot of freeboard went away. But after the, the big 97 floods that we had, the legislature agreed that that should stay in there, that they didn't want to see those kind of floods again in the future. Now that freeboard, it it accounts, it's a, a safety factor that when the, the engineers are doing the modeling, they're assuming everything's free flowing, there's no ice jams, there's no log jams, there's no debris obstructing those rivers and, and the culverts and bridges. And that's not the reality. We do have those things. And there's other uncertainty that they take into account. But here's a great picture from City of Benson in uh, Western Minnesota. And you can see those great big chunks of ice. You can see this railroad bridge is pretty restrictive. It's got all these you know, cow catchers that we learned are one of the main things that that's there for is for these big chunks of ice during times of flooding. So moving on to talking about the lowest floor. I mentioned that the lowest floor has to meet that minimum elevation. And FEMA has specific definitions of what's considered the lowest floor. But it's going to be the walking surface of that lowest enclosed area. And that would include basements, and crawl spaces. You don't have to be able to stand up in a, that area. You, it doesn't have to be a, a poured slab or a, a finished floor. It could be dirt, but it's whatever that lowest level is, is going to be your lowest floor for the regulatory purposes. And basically, basements are not allowed. They're prohibited for well, definitely for residential structures. There are a few exemptions we're in the Red River Valley where they can have a dry flood proof basement, but uh, those are just a handful of communities where that's allowed. And that lowest floor, if it's a, a lookout like this uh, where it's partly underground, that lowest floor is going to be that lower area. And it doesn't matter what you call it. You can call it a, a utility space or a mechanical space or your crawl space. Um, whatever that lowest floor is, that lowest surface is what has to meet the minimum elevations. So in this example, if this was in the flood 
zone. And this was the regulatory flood protection elevation. See, we, we have too many people to just ask people to answer by their by unmuting, but uh, be thinking about this. You know, would would this be allowed? And notice that this is a split level. You can see the patio door here. And while you're all thinking about what your answer would be, it would not be because that's a split level and that lowest floor does need to meet that minimum elevation. Now we do have some watersheds that still say that the lowest opening needs to meet certain elevations, but your city and unincorporated county ordinances, they have to meet that lowest floor, not the lowest opening has to, has to meet that minimum elevation. So the, the main requirement if you're building in a typical way on fill is that you can't be putting any fill in the floodway when you're building. Um, the lowest floor has to meet that regulatory flood protection elevation. So the flood elevation with any stage increase and your foot or freeboard. And for residential structures, there's a requirement for 15 feet of a, a fill pad that is the RFPE minus a foot. So basically at the flood elevation with that stage increase, um, it can come straight down or it can come down at an angle. There's no requirement, but 15 feet out, it still needs to be at this elevation. So if it's a new construction, then this would not be allowed. You wouldn't be allowed to have a crawl space that's below the regulatory flood protection elevation. Uh, one other term that people sometimes confuse with some of the, the flood elevation terms that we use is the ordinary high. The ordinary high is used for the boundary, the official boundary of our public waters. We use that for measuring setbacks in your shoreland regulations. And it's where waters bend for sufficient period of time to leave evidence on the landscape. So you're usually looking at the vegetation evidence. They look at the bigger trees and they calculate how high the water could have gotten without killing off those trees. They look at stain lines. They look at other evidence, physical evidence of where the water's been in the past. The 100 year flood elevation is usually higher than the ordinary high, in, in, unless it's some weird thing where the ordinary high was determined by a court or something. Uh, normally, the, the one year or the 100 year flood is going to be higher. And whereas I could go out as when I was an area hydrologist and point based on the physical evidence and say, oh, you know, the ordinary high is right about here. I cannot go out and do that with the the hundred year flood because there's the things that go into the calculating those elevations are how big is that drainage area, how much storage is there there, what kind of soils are there, you know, all those different things come into account. So you can't just look at the land and know that. And here's the official language out of the statute for the ordinary high. On streams, the ordinary high is the top of the bank of the channel. And as most of you would recognize, the floodplain certainly goes out of the channel and is higher than the typical ordinary high. And we do use the ordinary high, as I mentioned, for shoreland management setbacks. And it's based on that longer physical evidence, whereas the 1% chance is based on modeling some kind of engineering usually. So where do the floodplain regulations apply? Well, your, your rules, your, your ordinance will have language saying it applies to these FEMA mapped areas. But there's also language in state law that says, if there's a disconnect between the actual ground elevation and what FEMA mapped, you're still regulating the area that's adjoining that mapped area if it is below the flood elevation. Um, so like for instance, this area, this building here is up high and they might, looks like they could even still put in a basement and still meet those minimum elevations. But this building here that's not shown in the FEMA mapped area is still in a low area. And our state law says you're still regulating that building and making sure that their building 
safely and not increasing their flood risk. Mentioned at the beginning that our shoreland regulations uh, do impact uh, minimum elevations. And our shoreland regulations regulate within a thousand feet of those classified lakes and either within 300 feet of streams, rivers, or within the boundary of the mapped floodplain, whichever goes further. So the 300 feet or the edge of the floodplain, whichever goes further, that's all part of the shoreland district. Within the shoreland district, the wording in there does say, if, if you know the regulatory flood protection elevation, that flood elevation, you use the, regula- the floodplain rules that one foot above the 100 year with that stage increase. If we don't have that data, our shoreland rules say use the ordinary high or the highest known water level and you add three feet. So we still have some protection, even though you're outside of maybe the official floodplain, but you're within that shoreland district. And if you just have the minimums, this person who's just outside the shoreland district can put in a basement. We'd recommend that they not if they're in a low area, but um, and some communities have higher standards and require minimum elevations in their whole community or in broader areas. So talking a little bit today about some of the regulations, and I like this. This is a, a cartoon that was done for the associate, the National Association of State Floodplain Managers, and it's got this tent in the the highway or on the road and saying building in a floodplain is like pitching your tent on a highway when there are no cars coming. That with floodplain, unlike tornadoes and some of our other risks, we have a pretty darn good idea of where those higher risk areas are. And we can map those areas and we can think about where those higher risk areas are and avoid people building too low and increasing their risks with uh, new construction. So many communities, they have some kind of zoning. They, before they knew about their floodplain regulations or where the flood risk was. So they might, they might have had a commercial zone or a residential zone before the floodplain regs came along. But then they, the floodplain got mapped and we're overlaying that on that community map. We've, we now know, oh, gee, in this area, we got to be taking a look at what's the flood risk. And in some parts of the, the state, unfortunately, only a small percentage of our floodplain, we have detailed studies and we know where the floodway is and we know where the flood fringe is. And we'll talk about how in the floodway, we limit the uses. So that's essentially saying, that we've got different uses allowed. We're limiting the uses in this area that's mapped as floodway. In the flood fringe areas, it's an overlay in most communities. And you'll still have underlying zoning that you have to pay attention to, but you'll have some additional building standards to build safe in that higher risk flood area. And Uh, Again, as we mentioned on the maps, these are the old paper maps, and we talked about the dark area being that 100 year. That floodway on these older maps, if it is shown, will be shown with these cross hatches. There are some really old maps where they've got a separate floodway map, and that just shows an open area. And hopefully, if you've got maps that are still effective from the 70s, early 80s, and you've got two sets of maps, you get familiar with that second set of maps, your flood boundary and floodway maps. Flood fringe is that area in the 100 year floodplain, but outside the floodway. And on the newer maps, the red and blue cross hatching is that area where we're gonna be very restrictive. And the lighter blue area is that flood fringe area where the underlying zoning applies, but there's gonna be requirements for floodplain. And we'll get into more details on what's allowed in our floodplain administration training that we give later and in um, other of our trainings. But for today, we'll we'll just talk very high level in the floodway, as I've already mentioned, uh, we're very restrictive. Most structures are prohibited. The one type of exemption would be 
with a conditional use permit in an open space area like a, a, a park, you could be putting in an accessory like a park shelter with basically no sides that allows the flows go through. But otherwise, you know, new, certainly no new residential buildings, most new other types of buildings are prohibited in the floodway. And any filling, grading, if you're going to be putting in a road crossing or a trail along a river or a parking lot or anything, uh, they have to look at, they have to have an engineer look at whether it will cause any rise. And they have to show that that filling, that regrading, they're not making a new obstruction to the flow and causing more water to go on other properties. In the flood fringe, mentioned that whatever's allowed in the underlying zoning can be allowed, but there will be minimum elevations for those lowest floors. We do have some options to allow uh, an alternative elevation, either pilings, piers, or um, lifting up the building on basically perimeter walls that are wet flood proofed. And in our um, advanced training, we get into more detail on that and some of our other trainings, we do mention that it's in your model ordinance under the uh, the options to do that kind of a flood proofing, and it will require a, a CUP for any residences being using that method. We also do have requirements that things be anchored, that they be flood resistant, that you can't store materials that are injurious to plants, animals, and people that you're not putting pollutants in there. And a lot of those hazardous materials and pollutants, that actually comes from higher state standards. That's um, not in the federal requirements, but we have in state law. For much of the state, we don't have that detailed study. We don't know where that flood way is. So in those areas, from a, a regulatory standpoint, we're going to say, treat it all as flood way. You're not going to allow any new buildings in there unless they have a qualified professional engineer or we, we use some other methods that we talk about in our dealing with zone A training, some other methods where we can say this area is flood fringe. And I see Angie's asking about how do you administer pollutants above the RFPE? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if it's in the floodplain, if they're doing yeah, that you wouldn't you wouldn't have you wouldn't have authority from your floodplain regulations to administer above the regulatory flood protection elevation because that's going to be above the mapped floodplain. But that is something that would be great to talk about with our higher standards and how some of the watersheds and those that regulate outside of the the mapped floodplain, how they they work with that or what language we've got in our shoreland regulations. Uh, back to the zone A's, uh, what we do say too is that if someone wants to build near these areas that we say to take the flood elevation and the, the maximum stage increase of half a foot, add that and your foot of freeboard and have that be the minimum elevations any buildings that are on the just outside that area or that we determine based on like the shape and, and um, engineering standards that we know won't be part of the floodway. Development and what you regulate is anything within that map floodplain and within that area that is low adjacent to that map floodplain, you're regulating all development. And the federal standards require permits for any proposed development or construction in the floodplain. And they've got a very broad definition of development. Of course, it includes buildings, but it also includes uh, culverts, bridges, paving, excavation, grading, dredging, filling, any of those kinds of, 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 of activities, storage of materials or equipment. That's all considered to be development that needs some kind of permit. Now, what kind of permit will depend on your situation. If you've got building code and it's a building, your building permit works. Otherwise, you may have a land alteration permit or a zoning permit 
or a floodplain permit. Uh, as long as you have some kind of permit and you're looking at the things that are required in your ordinance. One thing that we do point out in our model ordinance is that if there is a DNR public works permit or um, a DNR public water work permit for the same project, so it's basically it's in the river and a negligible amount of the project is above the, the ordinary high, then that permit that the DNR issues can be used as the permit and the city or the county doesn't have to issue a separate permit. Again, assuming this is all covered by that DNR permit. If it's a minimal impact kind of thing, communities can choose to have really low cost or no cost permits, but there needs to be some kind of review and a permit. And a reminder that there are situations where it could be on a public water, but a DNR permit's not required because it's uh, not within a five uh, mile, square mile drainage area. Those are exempted from DNR permits and other kinds of situations. Uh, some situations that no permit is required that based on guidance from FEMA and our experience in working with FEMA on on what has to have a permit would be temporary structures. If someone's putting up a tent for uh, you know, a community festival, you don't need to give a permit for that tent that's going up in the floodplain. RVs, recreational vehicles, and they need to meet the RV definition that's in your ordinance, but they don't need a permit as long as they are travel ready. They have a license to travel, to, to be driven or pulled by a light duty truck. They've got functioning wheels. They You can quick disconnect them. Now, if they have something attached to them or they can't maneuver out of that spot, they're not travel ready and they would need to be permitted and need to meet your minimum elevations or they'd be considered a violation. There's some very small projects that FEMA's got wording in their guidance that says it, you know, insignificant uses, such as planting a garden, putting up a mailbox, you know, very small amounts of, of grading fill, those don't have to have a permit. And here we've got an example of a flagpole, if that's all you're putting in the, the, the floodplain, or a project where if, if I can haul it in the back of my, my car and I'm just putting in a few bags of soil and, and doing a little bit of, of work like that, I don't, the community doesn't have to require a permit. But if I got a bobcat out there and I'm moving a bunch around, that needs a permit. How about in this example? Pools, an in-ground pool definitely needs a permit. And in fact, that's really major alteration to the ground and that has to meet our shoreland management structure setbacks. But how about a temporary pool like this? That we would say doesn't need a floodplain permit, but I know some communities would say if it's over a certain distance from a safety standpoint, they're gonna require some kind of a local permit. We did put an article in our Water Talk newsletter back in July of 2020, and you can read more about pools in particular there. Fences, this is one that catches a lot of folks by surprise. You know, FEMA expects us to require a permit for fences, and there was some pushback on that when they, FEMA was telling us we had to update our ordinance and make it clear fences needed a local permit. We did negotiate that farm fences, and we've actually got state statute that defines farm fences. And the first part of that definition is these basic pole and barbed wire. Those don't need a floodplain permit. But these other kinds of fences, they do obstruct flows. They do catch debris and they do need to have a permit. And if they're in a flood way, you've got to show that they won't cause a rise. And people might say, oh, that can't be a big deal. But here's an example. This picture was taken um, right after a flood. The, uh, the river is over where this building is. This picture was actually taken because the area hydrologist was taking a picture of a, a building that was a violation that was built in violation of that ordinance, but got a nice view of this, this fence here. 
And it might be hard to tell what's going on here. Zoom in a bit. And the netting on that fence caught all that debris and bent over and basically did cause an obstruction in that area. Um, I mentioned earlier that if, if the DNR permit can be used in lieu of that local permit, if it's for the same project, and this is a reminder that we've got areas where we've got floodplain, but we don't have a public water. In this graphic, the yellow is the, the floodplain. The blue line is where we've got pub, public water courses. And that, if there's a crossing replaced here, it needs a local permit. You can't say, ah, oh, DNR is gonna take care of it because DNR doesn't have the authority there. And there's, again, other areas where DNR's permit requirement has been deregulated in some of the smaller drainage areas, or if someone wants to put in the same size and type of culvert, that got deregulated in 2015, but it still needs your local permit. So again, in the flood way, we're gonna be very limited on what the uses are. And even some of the uses that are allowed, that doesn't mean there won't be any damage. And I took this picture, this is a trail along the Mississippi River. There's probably some erosion they had to take care of with that trail afterwards. Definitely bumped over the light post, might have had other utilities they'd have to fix afterwards, but better to fix a few things like that than someone's house or, or business being flooded. Moving on to talking more about what's allowed in the flood fringe areas, we mentioned that um, buildings need to be elevated so the lowest floor is at the regulatory flood protection elevation. Here's an example of a building elevated, and here they had a bigger, a big flood, but they're they're still up there, nice and safe. The other thing I wanted to mention is that for non-residential structures, they can be elevated in other ways. They could go up on pilings or um, that perimeter wall without a CUP. It could be a, a permitted use. Um, but in our older model ordinance, that did require a CUP. It's only in our, our model ordinance that we've had up for a year now, since January 22, that we've clarified state law doesn't require a CUP for those non-residential buildings to use the alternative elevation methods. So again, we talked about this earlier, meeting that minimum elevation if they're elevating on fill. For Small accessory structures as a permitted use. Most of your ordinances will allow for a, an accessory that's 576 square feet or less. It's basically a 24 by 24 building is why we got a weird number there. And they don't have to be elevated on fill. Instead, they can have flood resistant materials up to that regulatory flood protection elevation. The utilities need to be above that elevation any of the controls, any of the parts that could be damaged by flooding. So like you might have wires that or piping that would be below, but the part that the controls and outlets and those kinds of things need to be elevated. They have to be anchored so they don't go floating down and become an obstruction at the next bridge or culvert. And they're required to have automatic flood openings on at least two sides of that building. And they have to be automatic. They, they can't rely on someone and going and opening them up. So it can't say, well, I'm just gonna go open those doors. That doesn't fly. That's not meeting the federal requirements. And the idea of the openings is to equalize the pressure. If you've got all the pressure on one side, it's gonna burst a wall. That opening is intentionally letting the water equalize on both sides of the wall, intentionally wet flood proofing that building and avoiding blowing out that uh, lower area. They do need to be within a foot of the ground and the area of the opening has to be in square inches, this, whatever the square footage of the enclosure is. So if it's a hundred, a thousand square feet or 500 square foot building, cause it's an accessory structure, you need 500 square inches of openings. And there are some engineered openings they're the equivalent of 200 square inches of opening. And uh, there's different vendors that have those. And there is a, a guide that gives an idea of what the equivalent opening is. Because if it you've got a bunch of bars in the way, that's not net opening. You have to figure out what the net opening is in those uh, automatic openings. 
I mentioned the Shoreland program earlier. There are different, there's a lot of overlapping um, parts of the Shoreland program, but uh, there are differences. The floodplain regs say you can't build in the floodway, whereas for the Shoreland program, you've got minimum lot sizes, you've got shore impact zone vegetation uh, management and bluff management requirements, and you've got a setback requirement. That setback requirement needs to be met. And sometimes the shoreland setback requirements more restrictive, and sometimes where that floodway is will be more restrictive. And, uh, and I talked about meeting minimum elevations. And I'm just gonna have a couple slides briefly talking about flood insurance, because we were almost out of time here, but flood insurance is available to anyone in a community that participates in the National Flood Insurance Program, no matter what zone you're in. One of the common misconceptions is agents will tell people they can't get flood insurance because they're not in the FEMA map zone. Wrong, you can get a flood insurance policy anywhere in the community. Where is it required? It's gonna be mandatory if you're in that high risk area, that mapped zone A area, you know, this crosshatch and the light blue on the newer maps, that dark shaded area on the older maps. And if you've got a federally backed loan of some kind, your lender will tell you, you must have flood insurance. There on the older maps, it's this area. And again, they're looking at the official map. So even though this person's really high, their lender must tell them to get flood insurance. There is an option to get um, a, an appeal, a letter of map amendment, and prove that you're high and then not have the mandatory flood insurance requirement. And we talk about that more in our mapping sessions. But this person, they might be low, but their lender won't call them in because they're not in the FEMA mapped area. Um, there's something new called Risk Rating 2.0. It's been around now for um, for all situations since April of last year and for any new policies for over a year. Uh, the main difference is that they no longer look at what zone you're in for determining what your flood insurance policy is going to cost. And you're not, it's not mandatory to have an elevation certificate, but it usually will help give you a better rate if you have an elevation certificate. And they're looking at first floor elevation versus lowest adjacent grade, whereas the old system they looked at your lowest floor versus the flood elevation. And they're looking at, this is what they used to look for, for factors. Now they're looking at a whole lot more factors. They've got a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. If you wanna know more, we'll talk more about that in our flood insurance uh, session. Um, the one last thing I wanna mention is that when you get flood insurance, usually the lenders are gonna say, I want you to have flood insurance for the building and there's, you can get up to 250,000 in coverage for your building uh, for residential, 500,000 for the non-residential. And then contents, you have a separate policy that you get at the same time that very limited in what it covers in a basement, but it covers you know, most of your stuff in the upper levels. And I won't say more than that uh, because we're at two o'clock and I wanna stay within our hour. 